Hey guys, so recently there's been a lot of talk about suicide. From um, TV shows like the Netflix show to popular musical artists killing themselves to people having personal experiences with friends or family members that have killed themselves. There's just been a lot of talk about suicide. And what I wanted to do today was read you a chapter from my book, which is called Hardcore Self-Help Fuck Depression. That's my book title. Um, I have it on Kindle here, so I can't show you the cover right now, but uh, it's a book that's available on Amazon, on Audible, in print form. Uh, it's, it's not very expensive. It's, it's a great tool for people who, you know, suffer from depression, but, or suicidality, or both, and, you know, don't necessarily jive with a lot of the self-help materials that are out there. But I want to read you a full chapter from it uh, today because I have a chapter that's literally called a chapter about suicide. And I find that suicide and suicidality, which I'll explain in the chapter, is something that's very misunderstood. And a lot of people who are on the sidelines uh, witnessing suicide don't really know what to do about it, don't know how to help, don't know how to understand it. A lot of misconceptions about it. So, you know, this isn't the 100% best answer, but this is something that maybe you could share with somebody if you think that they may be suffering. You could share with people that, you know, follow you on social just in case there's somebody who needs to hear it. Or maybe it's something that you just need to hear to uh, better your understanding of suicide. So I'm just going to read through the whole chapter. This is chapter four from my book, um, and it's called A Chapter About Suicide. It's here on the Kindle, so I'll just read it to you, okay? Chapter four, A Chapter About Suicide. Time to be straight up. I want to talk about suicide. That's right, I said it. Suicide. Some people seem to think suicide is like Voldemort, and we should never utter the name out loud. Or that it's like Beetlejuice, and if we say it three times, suddenly someone will decide to kill themselves. That's not how it works. In fact, I think a lot of people kill themselves because it isn't talked about. In this chapter, I'm going to talk about it. I would say trigger warning, but I wouldn't mean it. It's something that we need to talk about and something that we need to stand up to. Suicidality is a spectrum. Most of us has, have had the passing thought about what things would be like if we were gone and what it would feel like to die. Probably fewer of us have made a game plan and identified the method and circumstances that we would use to kill ourselves if we felt the need to. I think that we all lie somewhere on this continuum. Yes, being on the extreme end of it is dangerous, but just because you may fall farther to one side of the spectrum than the other does not mean that you're crazy or that you're hopeless. We have to get into a few terms here because I think that they get thrown around pretty casually and I wanna make sure that you understand them. The first one I wanna clarify is suicidal ideation. The term sounds scary and intimidating, but it's not too bad. Suicidal ideation just means that you are thinking of suicide. On the lower end of the spectrum, it crosses your mind once in a while, and on the high end of the spectrum, you're virtually obsessed with the idea of killing yourself. A word with a very different tone is suicidal intent. The word intent is a little scarier because it refers to the degree to which you plan to kill yourself at some point. Finally, it's important to understand the term means. This references the method that you might use to kill yourself, gun, bridge, knife, etc. Let me use a hypothetical example here to illustrate how these terms are used in a practical way. So let's say we're trying to understand Sally, who is a 23 year old recent college graduate who just suffered the loss of her mother and has been unemployed for the past six months like many others in her cohort. She certainly has a lot going on, but where does she fit on the suicidality spectrum? Sally has had the fleeting thought of death during rough patches throughout her life, but she currently can't seem to get the thought of it out of her head. No matter how hard she tries to shake them off, thoughts of death seem to creep into every empty space in her brain. Her little internal voice tells her that this is all just too much to deal with. She envisions herself taking every medication in her bathroom cabinet and falling asleep in a hot bath. This scares the shit out of her. She really does not want to die. In fact, she feels like she has to live for the rest of her family. It's just so damn scary having these thoughts. For now, she feels very confident that she will not try to kill herself, and she wants it to stay that way. Okay, sorry if that was a little intense. I just wanted to give you a realistic scenario to wrap your head around. In this case, Sally definitely has suicidal ideation that is at least moderate, if not severe. She's really preoccupied with the thought of dying. However, her fear of death and desire to find a way to live indicates that her intent is actually pretty low. Even though her intent is low at the moment, her level of ideation is definitely worthy of concern. For that reason, we wanna be careful about her means of killing herself. 
She identified one for us, which was taking the pills in her cabinet. In this scenario, it might be a good idea to enlist some help to make sure she is able to maintain safety as well as she would like to. I'm going to ask you to do something pretty damn brave for me here. You can do it. I want you to compare yourself to Sally. Right now, in this moment, where do you lie on the dimensions of suicidal ideation, intent, and means? There's no wrong answer here, but it's important for you to know. If your intent is high and you have a means that comes to mind immediately, I want you to seriously consider putting this book down right now and getting help. If you're in the United States, you can call 1-800-273-8255. This is the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, where people are trained to keep you safe. If you live in another country, you can Google suicide hotline and find some options near you. Depending on the country, you might need to adjust the word slightly. For instance, in some countries, the translation for suicide is closer to self-murder. So play around with the terminology and until you find what you're looking for. If you don't want to deal with the hotline and would rather just get the hell out of Dodge, you can call 911 or your country's equivalent emergency services number. They will come out and do an assessment on you, and if necessary, take you to a hospital where you will be kept safe. I know this doesn't sound fun, and it probably isn't, but this is not the time to think about convenience. We're talking about the permanent destruction of your life here. As far as I'm concerned, that's the most pure example of a medical emergency that there is. I want you to live. Suicidality that comes from depression is often a symptom that stems from the hopelessness that we talked about earlier. Your asshole of a brain is tricking you into thinking that there is no way out of your situation and there's no point hoping for anything different in the future. The old saying still definitely rings true. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary situation. Don't make that mistake, my friend. Things can change even if your douche brain won't let you believe it right now. If you aren't quite in the crisis or emergency side of things on the suicidality spectrum, there are some other things that you can do to help yourself cope. My first advice would be not keeping it a secret. I know that talking about suicide is scary as hell, and it should be. It's a frightening prospect. However, keeping it secret only gives it more power. Take back that power, my friend. Drawing suicidality out into the open can be one of the most protective things that you can do. I don't mean getting on Facebook and shouting it from the rooftops, unless that's really your style. I mean, you should tell your family, your significant other, your closest friends, or your doctor. One of the terrifying things about bringing up the topic of suicide is the prospect of people overreacting. I think some people imagine that as soon as they utter the word suicide, a special forces group will breach their wall or rappel down from helicopters and violently extract them straight to a mental hospital. That's not going to happen. Your family might react strongly, for sure, but that's because you're important to them. It may also be a big shock for them to hear this from you because you're better at hiding these thoughts than you realize. Of course, this is personally loaded. We don't all have good families, but I hope you see the point that I'm trying to make. If the people that you tell about your suicidal thoughts overreact, educate them about where you lie on those spectrums that we talked about, and help them understand what your level of intent is at the moment. If you aren't looking to kill yourself in the immediate future, let them know. Also, tell them that it is something you're struggling with. Tell them that you need them to be on your team while you find your way out of these scary and confusing feelings. I know it can be difficult to find the right words to say in situations like this, but just try your best. The words don't need to come out right, they just need to come out. So you tell people that you're thinking about killing yourself. Groovy. What now? Well, there are a few things that they can do to help. All of this comes down to the level of severity that you're experiencing with your suicidality. It's a little bit difficult to write in generality, so please pardon anything that doesn't directly apply to you here. One thing that most families or friends would be happy to do is limit your access to the likely means of killing yourself. The scenario that I described with Sally earlier is actually quite common. Pills are an easily accessible, non-violent means of ending a life. If you're on prescription medication or have access to drugs that have overdose potential, like Xanax or strong painkillers, consider buying a tiny safe for the storage of those pills and giving the key to someone that you trust. You can keep a small amount for treatment or emergency, but not enough on hand that you could possibly hurt yourself. If you need to access the whole bottle for any reason, you must go through that trusted person. The point of this strategy isn't to take away your autonomy. In fact, if you live alone and have no access to trusted people to help out, I would still encourage you to try out the safe method. The trick here is giving yourself intermediate steps. 
When you're in crisis, your brain tries to trick you into jumping from point A to point Z. Crisis states are temporary. If you include things designed to put more time between the impulse to kill yourself and your means of doing it, you will give yourself more opportunities to make a different, non-fatal choice. You know how fire extinguishers have that bold text on their storage case that says, in case of emergency, break glass? In this method, you make your own in case of emergency box. With my patients, I've often had this made literal by making a display case with glass on the front. If your means of suicide has anything to do with cutting yourself, please use your noggin and don't include the actual breaking of glass in your method. Just make a box with a latch or something like that. Anyways, the box itself is something that you fill up when you're feeling at your best, most hopeful self. When you have some clarity about your desire to live, fill it with pictures of people you care about, movie releases that you're looking forward to, clippings of grass, a Rubik's cube, a list of 20 reasons to stay alive, whatever makes sense to you as a person. Think of this as the emotional version of that shot of adrenaline that action heroes stab themselves with in the movies when things are most dire and they somehow need to get their broken body to push through another hour of over-the-top action. It's a quick shot of hope, reality, and reasonable thinking designed to postpone you taking action during the peak of your crisis, allowing you to reach out for emergency help if needed. Talking to your friends or family about your suicidal thoughts is one thing but telling a professional like your doctor or therapist is much more risky, right? Well, I wouldn't call it risky. It is certainly a different experience because most medical professionals, as well as people in helping roles like psychologists, therapists, and social workers are mandated by law to report you if they're concerned that you might be a danger to yourself. However, this isn't just an off the cuff judgment. The professional needs to evaluate you to see what your level of risk is. If you are just having thoughts, but no intent and no immediate means, you probably wouldn't expect any immediate action. However, after careful evaluation, if your doctor suspects that you're in serious risk of harming yourself, you can be held for your own safety. I know this sounds harsh, but I want to stress to you that this, this does not happen every time you talk about these topics. So let me put it into perspective for you. Over the past year, I was working in a major healthcare setting, seeing probably 15 new patients every week. I talked about suicide with probably 100 of them, and there was only one case that I ended up collaborating with to work out a voluntary hospitalization. Just like I suggested with your loved ones, be honest and clear with any professionals that you tell about these issues. Help them understand that you need support and how confident you may or may not feel about your personal safety in the moment. It's so important for providers to be aware of your situation in terms of suicidality. In some cases, it could even be related to a medication side effect. In others, they will simply want to be checking in with you over time to make sure things haven't taken a downward turn. When your doctor or helping professional evaluates you, there are a few things that they will be looking for. In addition to assessing you for ideation, intent, and means, they'll want to know if you've had any previous suicide attempts. Previous attempts are actually the largest predictor of future attempts. So it's something that would definitely be important to communicate to them. They also want to see what you are living for. I always ask on a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 is completely confident in your safety and 0 is the opposite, how do you feel today? When the patient answers, I follow up with, why not lower? Even if they're at a pretty low 3 out of 10 on the scale, their answer will tell me some valuable information about what is still keeping them alive at this very moment. Clinicians will also want to look at things like your level of guilt, any substances that you might be taking, what level of social supports that you have. Trust me, any doctor would be much happier to enlist the help of your family and send you home into their loving arms to keep you safe than send you to a hospital if that's a reasonable option. Let's say your doctor does determine that you're at serious risk of harming yourself and would like to put you on a hold to ensure your safety. What does that look like? This is another area that's hard to write about in generalities. I'll tell you what it looks like in the good old California USA where I practice. In my state, if a doctor, police off, peace officer, or other qualified clinician determines after their careful assessment that you're at immediate risk of harming yourself, they may place you under an involuntary hold for a few days. This is a way to keep you safe in the short term and hopefully connect you to resources that will allow you to move forward with your life with support while lowering your risk of harming yourself. Let me be the first to say that I 100% understand that the possibility sounds terrifying. I know it does. However, it's really super important for you to know that being hospitalized for suicidality 
does not mean that you're going to live out one flew over the cuckoo's nest or wind up in Arkham Asylum. Let me paint you a more realistic picture. When you hear the term hospitalization, it makes you think of sanitariums and other clinical scary settings. While there definitely is some variability in quality between different psych hospitals out there, in general, they're designed to be as comfortable as possible. They will look much like any other clinic or hospital you visited. When you arrive at the hospital, you will undergo an intake process in which your belongings will be collected and documented. You're usually allowed to have some personal items with you. However, they may temporarily confiscate any items that could be used in a suicide attempt. For instance, you probably won't be keeping glass items or clothes with drawstrings because an actively suicidal person could use those to harm themselves. You will most likely also undergo a short psychiatric evaluation. In most cases, they already have some information from the person or agency that referred you, but they'll want to make sure that they get a good picture of your current state, medically and psychologically. After going through your intake, you'll be given a room. This is where you'll be sleeping while you're staying at the hospital. Infrequently, you will be cohabitating with a roommate. It's no holiday inn, but it's not a jail cell either. At the hospital, you will meet a large range of people. There will be those people who would not have actually killed themselves, but were just not completely confident in their own safety. There will also be those who are talking to themselves, yelling in the night, and convinced that the staff is trying to poison them. This can be jarring, but it can also give you some much needed perspective on your own situation. You will have a few different evaluations with therapists and doctors during your stay. Their goal is to stabilize you, develop a plan for moving forward, and get you back out into the world. You will also be expected to attend groups intended to help you build coping skills and learn ways to regulate your emotions. It can be a bit overwhelming and scary for sure. Luckily, you're usually able to speak on the phone at certain times of the day and may have loved ones come to visit you. Sleeping is usually a bit restless in the hospital because it's unfamiliar and you're checked on throughout the night to ensure that you're still safe. It's annoying, but it's necessary. You'll be discharged from the hospital when your hold is expired and when doctors feel confident in your personal safety. You won't just be dumped out onto the curb with no plan. The whole idea is to help you ride out your crisis, give you some skills to take with you out the door, and to help develop a plan with mental health providers in the community to help keep you going in a positive direction once you're back out in the world. I won't lie to you, being hospitalized is tough. It isn't a fun experience. However, it is absolutely the right choice. Looking back on her hospitalization, someone that I know in my personal life made a metaphor that's always stuck with me. She said that she hated going to the hospital. She felt guilty that she had to go, and she just wanted to come home once she got there. However, she said that she would not take back the experience because it was a necessary step in her recovery. She described it like a broken bone. Sometimes when you break a bone, the doctors will have to re-break it in order to set the bone in the proper position for healing. Being hospitalized for your safety serves the purpose of resetting you and putting you on the path toward healing. I hope it's something that you do not need to deal with. However, I hope now you have a better picture of what the process looks like if it does come to that. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Sometimes it's just one important step on the path of overcoming depression. The final topic that I want to address in this chapter is self-harm without suicidal intent. In the field, we call it non-suicidal self-injury, or NSSI. And NSSI is an interesting topic because it can serve several purposes. I think the most common reaction to NSSI by people who have never been through it is to interpret it, especially the cutting variety, as a cry for help. While that certainly can be the case, there's often much more to it. If you cut, scratch, slam, burn, rip, or engage in any other variety of self-harm, you know what I'm talking about. Many times it's used as a tool. Self-harm is often a coping skill. It's not a good one and it's not safe, but it is a coping skill. Sometimes it occurs when things are too overwhelming and you want to feel like you at least have control over your own body. And other times it happens when you're numb and anhedonic and it feels like the only way you can actually feel something. I want you to think of NSSI as a symptom that tells you you need coping skills that you have not been able to locate yet. And this is what you're doing in the meantime. If you're in the NSSI camp, I don't want you to be ashamed, but I do want you to try to stop. A solid portion of completed suicides are accidental, and I don't want you to die. As you may have noticed, there's often a diminishing return effect that happens with self-injury. It's almost like an addiction where you need more and more of that physical feedback to have any emotional effect, and that's a slippery slope. If you engage in NSSI, the best course would be to get professional help. 
it is something that you can transition out of as you find more healthy ways of coping. Many people were scared about the prospect of bringing their self-injury up to their parents or their doctors. I know it's scary, but I'll echo my sentiment at the beginning of this chapter by saying that your permanent health needs to outweigh your temporary discomfort or embarrassment at this time. Another worry is how your doctors will react when you tell them. I want to stress to you that they should not simply sweep you away to the hospital if you tell them that you cut yourself. If you want to be very sure that they understand, you'll need to tell them why you cut. Tell them the purpose that it's served, that you don't want to die, and why you need help stopping. In the meantime, I'd like to give you one tip that could possibly help you scale back on this self-injurious behavior until you can get in to see a professional. I absolutely need to mention that this particular approach has not been researched for NSSI in particular, but I think it could potentially apply. There's been some research indicating that puzzle games such as Bejeweled, Tetris, or Candy Crush can help reduce the strength of cravings. The reason this research may be relevant here is that NSSI sometimes is very much like an addiction. From what I've learned from people who self-harm, they're often fighting a losing battle with the growing thought of it. Even though they don't want to do it sometimes, they can visualize themselves cutting, burning, or whatever method, and when they try to push that thought away, it gets bigger and more vivid. With these puzzle games, they basically override the portion of your brain responsible for the temporary storage of that visual information. It doesn't mean that you won't be able to visualize yourself going through with the self-injury, but now it'll be competing for mental real estate with the puzzle you're working on. I'll stress again that this is an extrapolation on existing research and that this particular method has not been supported yet, but it's essentially zero risk. So you can try it out for yourself. The next time you're starting to picture the process of release through your self-injurious method, instead reach for your phone and play 10 minutes of a puzzle game. See if that brings down your urge enough to make a more healthy decision. I'm sure I don't need to say it, but this is not a substitute for professional help or professional coping strategies. You still need to do that. This is just an in the moment coping strategy that you can try out. <sighs> we made it guys. I know it was a tough chapter. It can be hard to hear these things and I'm really proud of you for making it through. If this chapter really struck a nerve with you and you feel like there are some immediate steps that you need to take in order to invest in your own safety, please go do those right now. I'll be here when you get back. So um, that's the chapter on suicide. Hopefully it helps you understand a little bit better what you or what somebody else is going through. There are options out there. Suicide is something that is treatable in many cases. There are many different types of suicidality. There are many different reasons that somebody might be thinking about killing themselves. It's not selfish. You know, it's something that is often a symptom of underlying issues, but there are so many reasons that you can apply blanket statements to it. These are just a few ideas that might be able to help, a few ideas that help you understand a lot of the people that are going through it. But like I said, this is not the end all be all. If you are struggling, like I said in the chapter, please call the suicide hotline, reach out to a doctor, do something. Uh, I know it feels like there's no solution right now, that there's no possible way out of this, but that's a trick that your brain plays on you. There's always a way out of it. There's always something different that you can do with very, 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 very rare exceptions. So please try to do something about it and don't keep it to yourself. Don't stay silent. And if you see somebody that you think is struggling with it, talk to them about it. You know, you don't have to know the answers, but showing that support, talking to them about it, forwarding them this chapter, you know, getting them a copy of some sort of book, pointing them in the right direction is, you know, that's, that's enough. You can do that. So thank you for listening this, this far. I know I had a little bit of a hard time reading through parts of it. Uh, you know, I'm not the best out loud reader and I'm tired and it's hot, but it's important for me to get this out to you guys. So I'm going to let it be. And, uh, if you want to read through this instead, you're more than welcome to pick up a copy of the book. Like I said, it's on Amazon audible and everything like that. Um, I'm also going to put a written version of this chapter on my blog, which is duffthepsych.com slash blog. So you can check it out there. So my book, like I said, hardcore self-help, fuck depression. Here are the chapters, just in case it's interesting to you and you think of anything else that might you know, be worth following up on. So chapter one is called, Are You Actually Depressed? And that's about um, determining if what you're feeling is depression or whether it's something else like normal ups and downs or something else entirely. Uh, chapter two is about getting the ball rolling. It's called getting the ball rolling. And it's about trying to get yourself to stop being stuck in a rut to get you to be motivated, to get you moving again and feeling pleasure from things again, because often that goes away with depression. 
Uh, chapter three is called Your Brain is a Troll, and this is about the ways that your brain tricks you and some of the things you can do to take that power back from your immediate assumptions and your, you know, um, black and white thinking and other sort of cognitive mistakes you can make with depression. Chapter four is the one I just read called A Chapter About Suicide. Chapter five is called On Letting Go, and this chapter is about um, trying to help you leave the past behind because it can be really hard to move forward in your quest to defeat depression when there's just so much baggage from the past weighing you down. So this is some strategies for leaving that in the past and moving forward. Chapter six is called Let's Get Physical. So this is not only about physical solutions for depression, but also about physical contributors that you should look into to see if they might be making you depressed. Um, chapter seven is a letter to those who don't understand depression. And that's a way for somebody to, um, they could either copy the letter or take inspiration from it. And that's a way to communicate with other people in their life what they're going through. Because uh, it's very hard for people who don't go through depression to understand what it's like. Chapter eight is called Be Nice to the Future You. And this is about trying to set yourself up for success. Often with depression, you get in the habit of sabotaging yourself. And so these are some ways that you can use any moments of clarity that you have to set your future self up for success. Chapter nine is called Professional Help is Self-Help. This is all about different types of professional help you can get, um, how to do it, covering things like insurance, how to search for a therapist or a psychiatrist for medication, all those different sorts of things. And then chapter 10 is called Adventure Time. And that's a chapter where I try to help you gamify the process and make it uh, more fun and exciting and you know harness the, the, the role-playing sort of framework to motivate you to get on this quest and, and knock out some of these big objectives that you have. So thank you for your time and uh, you know, let me know if you have any questions about this stuff.